Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us tonight for this educational webinar. Uh, my name is Michael York, and I'll be your moderator for this evening, if you will. Um, if at any point you have questions during tonight's webinar, please feel free to go ahead and uh, utilize that question and answer function at the bottom of your screens. We like to make this um, interactive, and I know Dr. Hovanesian is happy to answer any questions that may come up, so be sure to go ahead and utilize that button down below. Um, tonight's webinar will be on LASIK. I know it's a very popular topic and we're excited to present that for you tonight. Dr. Hovanissian specializes in a lot of things, cataract, refractive, cornea, and pterygium surgery with Harvard Eye Associates and has an extensive knowledge uh, on tonight's topic. So we are very lucky to have him this evening. Dr. Hovanissian received his medical degree from the University of Michigan Medical School after which he completed his residency at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, where he served as the chief resident in his final year. After his residency, Dr. Hovanesian completed a two-year fellowship in refractive and corneal surgery uh, at the very well-known Stein Eines Institute at UCLA. Um, and among his many achievements, of which there are countless, uh, the most recent accolade comes um, from Newsweek in the form of his recognition as one of the top 35 eye surgeons in the entire country. So uh, a distinguished honor, um, and we're very, very happy to have him, obviously, at Harvard Eye Associates, but joining us this evening. So without further ado, uh, I'll pass things along to Dr. John Hovanesian. Michael, thank you very much for a nice introduction, and, and thanks everybody for joining us uh, tonight. I hope this is helpful and a little bit fun and, and interactive, and um, we welcome your questions and hope that you'll um, you know participate in that way. So we're going to talk about LASIK surgery, which is such a common topic and such a high interest area for so many folks because, uh, because it's exciting. Uh, the idea of looking forward and seeing your world in a different way is transformative. There's really no other word for it. And uh, for, for people who are born with limited vision, or at least who have limited vision as a uh, young adult or even older adult, uh, the prospect of uh, seeing better without glasses is is kind of remarkable to contemplate. There's not many things, you know, if we want to be a little taller, it's hard to fix. If we want to, you know, uh, be a little thinner, then, you know, that's hard to fix. And, uh, and yet, if we want to see better, that is easy to fix. And uh, they're a pretty simple process to go through. And we're going to talk about that tonight. Um, you know, how it works and, and what makes someone a good candidate, what you can expect. And of course, take your questions. Um, this really is the main question people ask, uh, is LASIK right for you? And it's a very personal question, uh, but for most people, it helps to have some basic information about it and to understand at a high level what LASIK is. So, you know, if you wear glasses or contacts, LASIK is for many people an option to uh, do less of that or do none of it. Um, it's been approved by the FDA since uh, 2005, or at least uh, the lasers were, uh, sorry, 1995. <laughs> um, it was uh, it was first approved, so uh, that makes it, what is it, 27 years now. Um, to correct uh, nearsightedness, whether you have or don't have astigmatism, the same with farsightedness, and astigmatism uh, by itself, which we call mixed astigmatism. And some of these terms get a little technical, and we don't need to be too technical, but we will explore a little bit what these different things mean. By the way, I expect that uh, tonight, well, I'll probably talk for, you know, close to 20 to 30 minutes. I'll try to, you know, keep it very concise, but complete, and we'll, we'll leave some room for questions for all of you. Um, so what makes you an appropriate candidate for LASIK? First is that you need to see better. <laughs> so if you've got one of the types of refractive error, um, you kind of need to be at least 18 only because our bodies change and our eyes can change uh, past age 18. I've seen 18 year olds who eyes, whose eyes are completely stable. And I've seen some folks whose eyes continue changing into their mid twenties. For most of us, our eyes are fairly stable by the time we reach the end of college. Um, and of course, our eyes have to be fairly healthy. Certain conditions make it impossible to uh, do LASIK. Other conditions, maybe it's it's sort of a maybe. Um, we have uh, experience over um, you know all the years since this this procedure was first approved. Uh, so you know what is that close to thirty years of experience with these procedures? So we have a very good ability to judge who is and who isn't. A, um, a candidate. Now, I'm, we're talking about LASIK by name tonight, but there are actually other procedures that 
uh, are similar to LASIK, and some people may be a candidate for those. But LASIK is by far the most common procedure that we've done, about 1 million of them per year in the United States alone. Uh, and there have been countless studies showing that it is safe, that it is effective. Um, particularly when it is performed as a, quote, all laser procedure. That means that we use uh, lasers to perform all the major steps of the procedure. Um, there's a concept called wavefront guided technology that uh, uniquely measures your eyes. Now, this is important because uh, LASIK in its early days was done where we just take your glasses prescription and put it into the laser. Uh, we have since developed much more precise ways of measuring the eye that we'll talk about. And it's important that your surgeon uses wavefront guided LASIK um, and because it leads to better quality vision. Uh, it leads to the highest form of satisfaction and it avoids problems like a glare and halos when driving at night that can happen with any procedure, but are much less likely when we more precisely correct the eye. Uh, so, um, you know, let's start with kind of how our eyes see, what sort of um, uh, magic allows us to see the beautiful world around us. Uh, the eye is uh, is a complicated organ with a lot of uh, a lot to it, but it's really if you think of it like a camera that helps you understand. There's a lens that really has two parts: a cornea, which is the dome shape like a watch crystal in front of the eye, and then the lens inside. They work together to focus light. There's a there's an iris, uh, which is literally called an iris or a sh um, an aperture that opens and closes. Uh, that's the pupil is the opening. Um, and then light passing through focuses in the back of the eye on the retina. So that would be the, the, um, the sensor or the uh, piece of film if you're old school, uh, like some people. <laughs> I won't name names, but uh, I certainly remember photographing with film. Uh, <laughs> there are three common types of nearsighted, of, uh, of, of refractive error, uh, nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism. Let's explore them briefly, but any one of these three or a combination of of the one of the first two with astigmatism can cause you to need glasses. So in a normally focused eye, light rays coming from far away from the right, pass through the focusing elements, the cornea and the lens, and are focused to a sharp point at the back of the eye on the retina with no assistance from other lenses. Uh, in the case of nearsightedness, a good, good way to think about it is the eyeball is too long or the front of the eye focuses light in front of the retina, meaning that what lands on the retina is the scattered light that's not well focused. And if you're one good way to know if you're nearsighted is if you're nearsighted, you can generally see up close. Sometimes it's way up close and sometimes a little further away, but you can do that sharply without glasses. But if, if you don't have glasses or contacts on, your distance vision is not that clear. So without glasses or contacts, if you can see up close, probably you're nearsighted. Now, farsighted is a little bit more confusing, but it's sort of the opposite in terms of anatomy. The light rays focus behind the retina, or the eye is maybe too short. The um, parts in the front of the eye don't focus light enough, don't bring the light rays together. Now here, um, everything is blurry, with one exception. When you're younger, when you're in your, you know, less than age 40, many farsighted people, and even a little over age 40, many farsighted people can focus enough to see distance. In fact, the adult who is farsighted very often had great vision as a kid, uh, could see near, could see far, but then gradually lost first the reading vision and even eventually the far vision that went away. That's farsighted. And the reason that happens is because the eye is straining to bring those light rays to focus onto the retina. And when you're young, your front of your eye has tons of ability to strain and do that. But as we age, we gradually lose that ability to strain and things fall back to um, focusing behind the retina and we just don't see as well. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then finally, there's astigmatism. And this, this is um, a little bit different still. So in astigmatism, what we have is the front of the eye doesn't focus uh, to a single point of light at all. Um, it, uh, it has sort of two focal points. And that's because the shape of the eye, instead of being shaped like a round surface, think of a basketball, is shaped like a, uh, an oblong surface, like a football. A football has kind of a complex shape to it. Um, think of a spoon, a spoon, uh, most like a teaspoon is kind of long and curved in a way that if you look at it like a mirror, if you turn it over, it doesn't focus to a, a single focal point, it's kind of an oblong shape and the eye with astigmatism works the same way. And so can we correct that with LASIK? Yes, we can. Um, 
So what LASIK is, obviously it's meant to address those problems, um, is a procedure using all lasers that um, uh, addresses the imperfections of the eye to completely customize the way you see uh, to correct those problems and more. Uh, so what we didn't talk about with nearsightedness, farsightedness, and so on, is something called higher order aberrations. Higher order aberrations, not important to remember the name, but what it refers to is other stuff, <laughs> other irregularities. If you're a photographer, you've heard about um, a spherical aberration, you've heard about coma, uh, you've heard about other issues that can uh, affect the way uh, a camera takes pictures, and the same occur inside the eye. And so, uh, Using wavefront technology, we analyze, measure, and then treat that. But in the basic concept of LASIK, there's really three steps. First is creating a map of the eye. Um, second is preparing the eye for the procedure. And finally is giving that treatment to the eye. So let's talk a little bit about that. The eye map is where we use um, a really sophisticated uh, machine that creates a 3D map of the way the eye focuses. And this is where we get into the um, uh, the detail of like, you know, as with the Mir space station, um, you know, the, um, uh, the ability to have fine detail for focusing of stars is based on correcting higher order aberration. So it's 25 times more precise than the way we prescribe glasses or contact lenses. Um, so um, after the eye has been measured and we've done some other testing to affirm that your eye is healthy, uh, we apply some numbing drops in the office. The whole thing takes about 10 minutes uh, and a laser uh, does not create any heat. In, in fact, you can't see the light of the laser. There's not a visible beam, but there is a comfortable light that you look at that um, uh, focuses your attention. And most people find that between our talking to them and their understanding what's happening, they're really quite comfortable. Um, it sounds scary. I, am I going to blink my eye? Am I going to close my eye? No, nope, you're not. We've done this in thousands of patients. And although you might blink your eye if we didn't otherwise have instruments that help you keep them open, those instruments don't hurt and they help you keep them open. <clears throat> and uh, uh, of course, there's a little bit of, um, uh, of you know, part for the patient to, uh, to try to cooperate, but uh, it's not difficult. You don't need to be put asleep. We do give you a mild tranquilizer so that you're more relaxed than you would be otherwise, because it's really normal totally normal to be nervous when you're having LASIK surgery. You know, it's a big moment in your life. You've thought about it for months and years. And so we, we get that and we fully um, take the time necessary to get patients comfortably through it. Um, the laser creates a flap, which um, uh, we use to, uh, uh, we lift in the surface of the eye. And then um, the um, uh, a second laser uh, actually applies the map. So we take that sophisticated measurement of the way your eye focuses and then apply it to the eye. We put that detailed prescription onto the cornea itself. Um, and then this flap, which is the very surface layer of the cornea, we lay back down. It doesn't hurt at all. And it sticks back down sort of like a contact lens. But that contact lens, that flap is made of your own tissue. And so it goes right back into position. And it's quite unusual for it to uh, give you any problems or irritation. A little bit of scratchiness afterwards is normal. Some people say that uh, they feel like they've been in a swimming pool a little bit too long for the rest of that day, but we encourage our patients to go home and sleep, uh, and uh, and that is really the best way to uh, to do it. And most people have an easy time doing that. Um, the reason is that uh, you know you're really amped up before the procedure. You're a little bit nervous, and then afterwards, once you know that everything's gone well and you've had this little bit, uh, bit of tranquilizer that you've taken, it's pretty easy to go home and take a nap. Um, and for many people, when they wake up from that nap, already they can see better. In fact, already you can begin to see better, usually when you get up from the laser. So immediately you get a sense of better vision, although it can still be very foggy at that point. Um, not so foggy that you can't walk and take care of yourself, uh, but you know the best thing to do is go home and just nap. And, and even within hours, the, uh, the eye starts to see better, it, it feels normal, and, uh, and you, you begin to see what your new life will be like. So um, I'm gonna pause there uh, to see if there are questions. Um, I'm gonna look at the chat here and see if there are any, I think. Uh, Michael, are they able to uh, post uh, questions in the chat to us? Yeah, so if anybody does have any questions at, at any point during tonight's presentation, please do feel free to utilize either the chat or the question and answer function. I either work well. 
Um, but Dr. H will be, Dr. Hovenasian will be happy to address them as we go. Um, it looks like of the, as of the moment, everybody's understanding everything. Oh, and looks yeah. like we have our first question. Yeah, so um, uh, Asan asks an appropriate question about uh, how do you, what do you mean by applying the map? Well, what the laser does is uh, very quickly within a matter of usually uh, less than 60 seconds, uh, the second laser um, applies or uh, treats the cornea by uh, ultra short uh, pulses that are not painful and that the light is invisible um, and that it, it delicately removes tissue um, a quarter micron at a time. So uh, to give you an idea, uh, a quarter micron is uh, a red blood cell is about seven microns in, in diameter. So this is one 28th uh, of the thickness of a red blood cell. And as you can imagine, red blood cells are very tiny. A human hair is something like uh, uh, 30 microns, I think, in thickness, uh, depending on the color of your hair. So um, the um, uh, it, it's a very small amount of, um, of tissue that's removed with each pulse. Uh, the flap is not a cataract. The flap is part of the cornea, uh, Gene Jacobs asks. Uh, and uh, thanks for thanks for that question. Uh, the flap is part of the very front of the eye. Um, and uh, there's a question also from someone else about if you've had uh, corneal replacements for vision impairment, can laser surgery correct the vision to 2020 or better? Um, the um, cornea replacements, I think, means a corneal transplant. I uh, I imagine the um, the ability to correct vision for someone who's had a previous corneal transplant, it is possible to treat. We've had some very good success with that. Very much depends on the individual. I certainly wouldn't, um, you know, in this forum, be able to comment on, on what we can do. Can we theoretically improve vision? Yes. Can we make it 20, 20 or better? Boy, that sure depends. Um, so uh, hard to answer that definitively. So before the procedure, let's pause questions for just a second. We'll come back to them a little bit later. Um, a comprehensive exam is performed, and it takes, you know, about a half an hour. Um, if, you, if you're looking for just a very quick evaluation, yes, we can do that in uh, 30 minutes or less, and we do not need to dilate your eyes for that exam. Uh, to do the actual procedure, at some point, we would need to dilate your eyes to properly examine them. Um, and that, if you've never had dilation before, it means that they're just a little blurry and lights are a little bit brighter for a few hours afterwards. We do a whole bunch of tests to uh, determine the map of the cornea and to determine that LASIK is safe. Um, to, to get a quick consultation to find out if you're a candidate for LASIK, which is usually the good way to start, uh, you don't have to take out contact lenses for, uh, at all, just to remove them for the, uh, for the consultation. Uh, but if you uh, are going to have a procedure, we do need you to take out soft contacts for a week, hard contacts for at least two weeks, uh, or gas permeable contacts at least two weeks, just so we can be sure that your cornea, we know exactly what we're measuring and exactly what we're treating and you know that little bit of sacrifice is well worth it for a lifetime of better vision. So, um, uh, on the procedure day, um, the uh, a lot of people feel nervous, and I think I touched on this. We we not only use numbing drops, which don't hurt, uh, uh, but we uh, we give you a mild tranquilizer. You may feel a little bit of pressure. Uh, most people do not feel pain at all. And we do usually treat both eyes at the same setting. One question from the audience was, is there a maximum eye prescription that LASIK is recommended for from Tiffany? Um, there is, um, there is. Uh, there's a range uh, from about uh, plus four on the hyperopic side to about minus nine or, you know, the FDA approves it to minus 11, but most people who are minus nine, 10, 11, do better with another procedure called an ICL. And let me pause for a second to, you know, kind of give some props to Harvard Eye in this respect, because um, there are a lot of places that do LASIK surgery where really all they do is LASIK surgery and they do a very good job of it, but that's all they do. And if you are uh, a candidate for more than one procedure, we think it's nice for you to understand what those options are. And we, we think it's appropriate for us to tell you uh, what they are. As it turns out at Harvard Eye, we perform all of the refractive procedures that are uh, approved in the United States. In fact, we have access to procedures that are part of FDA clinical trials that uh, some doctors have never even heard of. And, uh, and we, we don't ever do anything experimental or investigational without a patient wanting it and understanding it fully. But we certainly offer the wide range of procedures based on what's right for the patient, not based on what we do. So. Uh, we think that's a nice advantage you have in working with us. Um, so following your procedure, you're given some eye shields. It's like a clear plastic cover that you can see through. 
Uh, it's on just for a few hours while you sleep, so you don't accidentally rub your eye while you're sleeping. You do need someone to drive you home because you've uh, been sedated and your vision's a little blurry. And as I said, you should take a little nap and expect some blurriness. But with time, even the day of surgery and certainly within the next few days, you will see better and better. Most people can work the next day. Most people can drive and, you know, and shower and use a computer and, you know, and do most things. Exercise is fine. Um, we don't want you doing anything super sweaty or we don't want you in a real filthy environment like a, you know, a construction site where there's nasty dust everywhere um, for maybe a week after surgery. We also advise you not to um, do uh, uh, swimming or hot tubs or anything involving a pool of water or the ocean for about two weeks uh, just to prevent any risk of infection. Uh, we typically see our patients the next day after the procedure to make sure everything's going well. Um, and, uh, and, and as I said, most people go back to work the next day unless you're by doing so you would, you know, be doing one of those restricted activities. Um, so, you know, we use a particular technology called iLASIK that uh, we've had terrifically good uh, success with. We've used a variety of, you know, I've performed thousands of these procedures, refractive procedures all over the world using a whole variety of um, of equipment. I've, you know, conducted research from the first generation of approved lasers to the most recent. And, uh, you know, I've really had the best and longest success with the evolution of technology that we're using. And so this has been updated about every year. There is some significant update to the way the technology works. But what it's based on is the idea that we have a wavefront uh, guided um, procedure. That means we take those both lower order and higher order aberrations in the eye and we correct them. Uh, so um, that means that we're, uh, we're measuring far in excess of what you do with glasses or just contact lenses to give better vision. Um, and here's just kind of a comparison of wavefront guided on the left. This is what we do versus the more traditional manifest refraction. That's just referring to, um, you know, glasses, the way we measure glasses and contacts. And you'd be surprised there are a number of LASIK centers that use that older technology because um, it's uh, it's more affordable for them to do. Sometimes they're sort of the, the discount type places often do that because um, it's a cheaper way to do LASIK, but the results are very different. It would be like you're buying a new car, but you're buying a model that's 1995, or do you want to buy a model that's 2022 or 2023 model year? You want the newest technology when you do this, um, and the cost difference is really not that great. Um, so the eye design, uh, without getting into too much detail, is that device that measures the map. It's, uh, you know, it's the computer brain that takes your eye and applies uh, math to it to come up with a formula that describes that map and then can dial it into the laser. And so you see how there's this sort of color pattern where in this area where the yellow is, we're treating a little differently than we are in this blue area where it's, uh, you know, maybe a flatter um, focusing pattern. The laser responds to that with high spatial resolution so that we can dial in your uh, correct uh, treatment. Um, this allows us to do it. Uh, the the, uh, the all laser option with the IFS laser that we use allows us to do everything without any blades uh, and to create a um, altering the tissue in a way that is uh, very strong and stable in the eye so that you're less likely to have any issues as you heal. So here we see sort of this, it almost looks like a contact lens uh, off center in the eye, that's the flap. So we've created that flap with the laser and reflected it back. And then using the eczema laser, that's the second laser. This is what, what answers the question from Asan about how do you apply the map to the eye. The laser beam moves around painlessly. It shows like it's, like it's visible here. It's not visible in the real world. That's just for illustration. And, uh, and it even does an iris map. So the, the laser, when we diagnose, when we, when we uh, evaluate you in the clinic, it takes a picture of your iris and it, it won't let me treat in, unless it's the same iris <laughs> under the laser. So there's no chance of giving the wrong patient's prescription. Not that that's ever happened, but it's a nice reassurance. Also, if your eye rotates slightly, which it does when you lie down, when you go from standing up to lying, it'll compensate for that. So it's just ultra precise, uh, the, the science that goes into this. Um, so there are other procedures like LASIK that use the same laser, and for some patients, there are medical reasons why they may be a better candidate for one or the other. Most of our patients choose the eye LASIK procedure, the, the LASIK procedure, because, because it works. Uh, the vast majority of patients can see 2016 or better. That's better than 2020. 
Um, people see a great improvement in their ability to function and do daily activities without glasses or contacts. And, um, you know, activities, the hardest things that we do visually, like driving at night, that they can just be more comfortable with that. Um, you know, there's a variety of studies that look at this different ways, uh, but the vast majority of patients not only are uh, seeing extraordinarily well, better than 2020, but they, um, you know, more, more importantly, they're happy and they are, you know, thrilled to, uh, to have a life that is much less dependent upon glasses um, and generally free of glasses. So um, I, that, that's really the end of the presentation. I have a bunch of slides that are for frequently asked questions. I'm not going to go through them um, because I think that, uh, you know, it, it gets a little boring, <laughs> but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that, uh, that anyone has if you want to post them. Um, a great question that Hassan asks again, will I need another LASIK operation uh, in the future if I go through one now? Um, also, can LASIK remove floaters? I'll answer the second question first about floaters. LASIK will not remove floaters. Those are actually in the back of the eye in the vitreous gel. Um, and, uh, and we're just refocusing the eye in front. Um, as to will you need another LASIK procedure in another decade or two? I don't know how old you are, uh, but most people need LASIK once in their life. Now, one thing that happens to most adults uh, in our mid to late 40s or early 50s is they start to wear reading glasses. So if you're born with perfect vision, uh, you can see far and because your eye can strain just a little bit, like I described earlier, you can also see up close. But most of us in our late 40s will start to lose that reading. You, you may have friends or you may remember mom or dad pushing things back further away because they could focus on it. And we do that because we don't have to focus as hard. We can hold it further away. Um, and, and with reading glasses on, you can hold things at a normal distance. That process, that loss of reading vision happens to you whether you have contacts, whether you wear glasses, or whether you've had LASIK. So you may at some point start to need glasses for reading if you're 25 today and undergoing LASIK. Um, if you're 45 or 50 and undergoing LASIK, we'll talk to you about that so that we can give you an expectation of what you, know, what you can expect. Um, in some cases, and we're getting a little complicated here into the weeds, but some of our patients who are over 40 or 50 um, will choose to have one eye corrected for clear distance and one eye corrected for a little more up close vision. That combination sounds a little weird, but actually uh, we usually try it with contacts before we commit to it with LASIK. And most people say, gosh, I love the vision. I hate the contact lenses. Let's do LASIK for monovision. And that works really well for a lot of folks, not everybody. And we wouldn't ever do that without being quite confident that that would work well for our patient. Um, hopefully that answers Asan's question. Another uh, time point in life to think about is in our 70s. You know, so in our 70s, most of us will um, need cataract surgery. Cataract happens for another reason. It's because the lens inside the eye loses its flexibility. Or, sorry, it becomes cloudy, loses its clarity. And the way we solve that problem is by replacing that lens with an artificial lens implant. And that lens that we give will correct uh, your vision for the rest of your life beyond that point. So, you know, I think of for most people, uh, kind of two stages of, of treatment. LASIK happens at a younger age and cataract surgery happens at an older age. Uh, many of our LASIK patients will eventually wear reading glasses up close or could consider an, a, a touch-up procedure in one eye uh, for their LASIK to adjust it for better reading vision. That's an option you would also have. Um, but uh, for most people, LASIK now and cataract surgery eventually, no matter what, uh, you know, if you live long enough, you'll need cataract surgery. And by the way, if you're over 50 and you're thinking about LASIK, one of the things we will explore when we see you in the office is whether doing uh, a, an early version of cataract surgery could be a better option for you. Because when we do cataract surgery, we have some incredible implants that can help you to see far and near and in between uh, with, with just great quality vision. So um, again, one of the nice things about Harvard Eye is the broad range with almost 20 doctors and you know uh, almost 200 years of combined experience. We do everything and we've got uh, you know the expertise, the technology that you need for your life to have good vision when you're young, good vision when you're older. So um, I'm going to, um, you know, I can just hit on a couple of the high points here. I'll leave the presentation like this. 
you know, some of the things we look for is, um, you know, our, our diseases of the eye. Like if you have significant dryness, if you have thin corneas, um, uh, those kinds of things uh, we look for in your exam. Uh, here's uh, Asan's question uh, about, uh, is the procedure permanent? Um, occasionally about uh, two or 3% of the time we need to do a touch-up procedure. Why would that be with LASIK that you wouldn't get it with one procedure? Um, it's pretty rare. First of all, as I said, it's about 2%. So think about it as a one in 50 chance, but there's sort of two parts of the equation when we do a, a LASIK procedure, what we do and how you heal. Um, what we do is incredibly precise. I've never had a case where we program the laser for one thing and we got another. Um, because it, it just, it, it, it's ones and zeros. It, it only works so many ways. But we have seen cases where healing of the eye changes a little bit the way it focuses after the procedure. The good news is that's easy to fix because it's usually a very small amount of, of uh, change. And so we can do a, a, a touch up uh, and we don't charge anything to do that. Um, that's uh, on us to uh, provide that. It's a small procedure um, and, and it helps. Uh, will I still need glasses after LASIK? Most people don't uh, is the short answer to that. But if you're over, uh, you know, over 50, you probably will for reading unless we do monovision uh, that I described. Uh, and there might be activities where you feel more comfortable. So uh, here's an example. Uh, it's a, if we do LASIK surgery, it's, uh, you know, extremely likely that you won't need glasses to pass a DMV test. You won't have a restriction on your license to, to wear glasses to drive. But it's possible that when you drive at night in an unfamiliar area, going 75 or 80 miles an hour on the freeway, that you're going to want a pair of glasses just to take you from 2020 to 2010, just to make it a little bit sharper to give you greater confidence to see what's happening in the shadows, uh, simply because, it, you know, no matter how good we get it, glasses might refine it a little bit for you. So we can't make promises that you'll never wear glasses for anything. Most people don't. But if you do, uh, that's not a problem. Um, so I think we've answered most of these other questions. We're happy to, uh, take any others that you have. Um, I'm just looking through the questions to see if there's something important enough to cover. Um, if you're pregnant, you probably should wait to have LASIK. Um, if you're, um, uh, on medication, you should tell us what it is so we can advise you uh, as to whether that could affect things. Does the procedure hurt? No, <laughs> um, it does not. Um, so, uh, a question from Craig who is, uh, has had corneal transplants and, uh, has some glasses for certain activities. Um, yeah, it's going to be hard, Craig, to answer your question without a proper evaluation, uh, you know, about what you could expect if you did or didn't have LASIK. I'm, I'm sorry to have to punt on your question, but it's a pretty... Uh, you know, what we do after a corneal transplant and how well you can expect to see depends on so many things I can't, um, I can't really guess at in a call like this. So I'm a cornea specialist who's, uh, who's trained in LASIK and uh, be happy to see you in the office and uh, evaluate what options you'd have for your corneal transplant. Uh, will I be given something to calm my nerves? Yes. Uh, will I be awake? Yes, but comfortable. Um, what happens if I blink or move? The laser is constantly tracking everything you do. It is almost impossible for you to screw anything up uh, as the patient, because um, it's it, what, what happens if you move too much is the uh, the laser uh, just simply pauses until we're you know comfortable and ready to proceed. How long does it take? About ten minutes. Um, can you drive yourself home? We cover that. No, you shouldn't because you're sedated. Can I read, watch TV on the day of LASIK? It's better not to um, to spend too many too much time on screens. When we are on screens, we don't blink as often. And what our eye needs is a lot of lubrication that day and uh, just some rest. And um, it'll be a little fuzzy anyway, not bad, but a little bit fuzzy. And so we recommend, yeah, you can go on your phone to you know text back your friends, I'm doing great, but don't spend a lot of time on Instagram. Don't spend a lot of time reading your feeds because um, it's not going to be. Um, it's not going to allow you the best way to heal <clears throat> and uh, just, you know, put on some music or cue up some podcasts and, uh, and have a chill day. If I may say that, um, special precautions. We talked about eye shields for a couple of nights afterwards. 
Yeah. And I think we've covered most of what's there. So, um, and for those of you so inclined, there are some references to, uh, um, for, to the scientific literature. So um, we've had some great questions and some good dialogue tonight. I, um, I'm grateful to everybody who participated uh, in this meeting. Michael, can you uh, finish up and let our audience know um, if they're interested, uh, you know, how they could learn more about LASIK? Yeah, of course. And if you're anything like me, Dr. H, and you need some time to kind of digest all that information and you may have questions later, um, later on tonight or later on in the week or, or as the days follow, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach out to two different, um, you can reach out to my email, which is pretty simple. It's just M York, M Y O R K at harvardi.com. Um, or you can adjust follow up questions to the exact same email um, that you uh, subscribe for tonight's talk as well, which was marketing at harvardi.com. Um, additionally, if you're thinking, oh, you know what, I, I would love to hear, you know, remind myself of one of the talking points that Dr. Ovenisian covered tonight. This conversation has been recorded and we'll be happy to send those out after tonight's presentation um, in case, you know, you want a little refresher on everything that was mentioned here this evening. Um, we're happy to address it that way as well. Um, additionally, if you do feel the need to come in, we are happy to provide you a complimentary consultation with Dr. Hovanesian or one of our other wonderful refraction doctors at Harvard Eye Associates. So don't hesitate to reach out to us as well via email and we're, we're happy to get you scheduled for, for one of those complimentary consultations. So um, Dr. Hovanesian, any, any last words before we end tonight's webinar? Oh, you know, putting all the technology aside, um, LASIK is just wonderful. It is, uh, you know, I, I can't express to you how many hugs and kisses we get from our LASIK patients for, for changing their lives. It's a really enjoyable uh, thing to see the transformation that, that people experience. And so whether it's LASIK or something similar that's better suited to you, um, encourage you to learn about it, be educated about it, and, uh, and let us help you uh, get comfortable with whatever choice you finally make. You, you won't ever get a sales pitch at Harvard Eye. We're here to, um, you know, to, to be your neighbors and uh, you know, the expert in eye care who you can trust uh, your eyes with. So um, we, we welcome your contact and look forward to helping take care of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hovanesian, for uh, the information. And thank you all for joining us tonight. We really do appreciate you spending a little bit of your evening with us um, here via the webinar. So we appreciate it. We hope to see you soon, and we hope everybody has a wonderful evening.